<laughs> okay, we're going. We are going. Okay, excellent. I've got this. I've got my mug here that says, "Where there's a woman, there's a way." Okay, <laughs> that's good. Ken gave me this. This. Um, okay, so look into the camera. Okay. Um and. Hello, everybody. Oh my gosh, it's so exciting. It's 8 p.m. Eastern time, a little bit afterwards, 5 p.m. Pacific time. I'm delighted to be joining you tonight with my friend, colleague, mentor, um, <laughs> Monica Gandhi from UCSF, who is an infectious disease specialist, global public health expert, HIV researcher, and all around um, excellent human being. So Monica, thank you so much for joining me tonight. I'm thank really you. Excited. Thank you for having me. Um, I mean, what a day it has been. Um, you know, I wonder how everybody else out there is feeling given the news of the day, the show. Yeah. I mean, what a, what a, what a, what a, what a day. I mean, I don't know about you, but I was sitting at my desk to sort of. Justice a is kind of trembling a little at bit. least served. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah, it was uh -huh. a big day. It was a big day. It was. Accountability. There's a lot of emotion and a lot of, uh, uh, yeah, it went the right way. Went the right way. A lot of emotion. And as you and I have been talking about in the public space, you know, we can have many emotions in one, in one moment, right? We can have hope. We can have optimism. We can be fearful. We can be cautious. And I mean, to me, that today encapsulated many, many of those emotions. I mean, trauma and hope. And one, and and what, what I was, what I want to talk with you about tonight. There's so many things I want to talk with you about tonight, um, from the extraordinarily stunning data on the vaccine efficacy to what's happening around the world to yes, what we expect for the summer to optimism to nuance. Um, can we start with, um, start with the data on the real world data on the vaccine efficacy, better than the trial data, better than expected. Yeah, I mean, exactly right that, you know, we all learned in medical school and epidemiology, the word efficacy is what happens in the clinical trials. And then the word effective, the word effective is what happens when you roll out that intervention in the real world. And usually efficacy is better than effectiveness because uh, the real world is messy and it's uh, th there's like people not wearing masks and there's like surges going on in some places and there's cases. And so it should have been that the data looked worse and the data um, looks fabulously even better. And what I mean by that is that the two things that really are incredible is the April 1st, since we last talked, I think the April 1st Pfizer press release that they put out on 44,000 people across the planet um, asking how they did with the vaccine. And uh, 100%, we don't get 100% in life very much, but 100% efficacy against severe disease. That was, of course, even in places like South Africa where the B1351 was circulating. So it is sort of stunning effectiveness. And then I think the second is what we've been commenting upon upon Twitter that people somehow miss, seem to uh, to not realize how incredible this was, but it's just the CDC breakthrough data from last week. I mean, that's done. <laughs> I just put in my newsletter last night or two nights ago, 0.005%, yes, two zeros. And no, then, three, uh, zeros, three zeros, three zeros. I know it's, it's ridiculous. It seems like it's two zeros, but that's because it's three It was zeros. three zeros, but now it's three zeros. <laughs> so it's, it's out of, like you said, 77 million people. Right there were like 5,800 infections and actually 29% were asymptomatic. And we can talk about that, but I don't think we should be testing asymptomatic people after vaccination. I, I wanna talk about that, yeah. sure, but maybe as a, like the icing on the cake. Yeah, and so the then is, like, you're, you're, if you take those yeah. guys out and even if you don't, it's still three zeros and then either an eight if you include the asymptomatic or five. So it's 0. 0.000, yeah. I always have to look at it, 5% who had breakthrough infections. And then those who are hospitalized, then there's four zeros and then a number five and then percent. So it's six zeros, five. I mean, then you times it by a hundred to get a percent. It's sort of, it's it's pretty amazingly low breakthrough rate, amazingly low. It's an amazingly low breakthrough rate, meaning after vaccination, your risk of getting COVID-19, which is by definition symptomatic COVID, is right. 0. 0.0005%. Correct. There's very little in life that is that low risk. Right. 
walking right. to your front door, getting in a car, having a sexual relationship with anybody. Right. Um, you know, walking. I mean, it's it's just very hard to contextualize. It's, I think because they're so stunningly effective that it's very hard to believe. It almost feels like a religion to people that it's hard to believe. Um, but what I'm trying to bring into light to people every day in my office, um, particularly as people are experiencing extraordinary fear, yes, pre-vaccination pre naturally, but then post-vaccination, is that it's hard to get COVID after you've been vaccinated. It's you so hard to get COVID. Hard. You'd have to really try hard. You'd, I, hard. I you'd have to show up in an ICU yeah. in India, which, I mean, yeah. with all due respect, I mean, and they are, it's it's hard they're going to through it but yeah. it's also not mysterious why that's happening yeah no i mean that the vaccination rate in india is about five percent at the moment um and uh and i want to see more data on one of their vaccines but but yes they have a very low vaccination rate and they have very crowded environments yeah. and they avoided a lot of the terror and now it's happening now and it's very sad it's so sad and i mean i think we have an obligation this is a separate subject as a, as a country to support them yes and you know if you want to be you know egocentric about it supporting india supports us we're and only as safe as everyone else that's yeah right. that's right yeah that's i mean you could put it that that is true of every infectious disease like we like let just put it selfishly you're only as safe as the rest of the world so vaccine equity globally is profoundly important for us Right, because it's it's like whoever put whoever made that analogy in the wee early hours of the pandemic that it's like having a year uh, like a a year a, a urine free area in a swimming pool, like you can't. Oh. Like, don't be, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's a good analogy. Right, right. yeah. Like, those don't exist. Like if yeah. have a kid pees in the pool, yeah, we're, we're all affected. Yeah, point is that um, I don't know why I went right there, but my point is that <laughs> that, that that it's important. I mean, you're you're talking about. Right. Things that like we, we can do to help us get through this pandemic, which is to support the rest of the world get their vaccines. Because right. no matter how much you shut down, mass distancing, ventilation, and also let's remember this very crowded um, environment with, with very large slum areas, for example, in Mumbai, you cannot, nothing, those are tools. I keep on calling those tools and I keep on calling the vaccine the solution. I don't know who said a vaccine is another tool in the toolbox, only if that tool is like the biggest hammer ever. So it is, it is the solution to the pandemic. Yeah, not a tool. One time we had, we only had oh, yeah. distancing and ventilation. That was the only tool. Yeah. They were, they were, they were, decent instruments and they're still very good instruments when you are not vaccinated but once you've been vaccinated it's hard to get COVID-19. It's now, so hard to get it and to give it. And to give it. Okay so let's talk about the giving it but, but, but before that people who've been vaccinated this is what I'm trying to stress to my patients that if you've been vaccinated your risk is so infinitesimally small. That's yes. not to say it's zero risk. You can get COVID. You could get a cold. You could get a mild flu. But that is a risk that you undertook every day by going on a plane, walking out your front door, going to a meeting, going to work without thinking about it. Right. The risk of, right. of death and severe disease is off the table. It's oh, amazing. Wow. Yeah. And so so again, it's it's really hard to it's I mean it's so hard to conceptualize how low repeating it. Yeah. <laughs> it's 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 and I I I, I the thing is nothing ever worked out this way like so to see the real world effectiveness data i'm still astounded every day i yeah. and um and it, it gives me so much hope to not, not only the world will get back to normal but that our patients lives like you said can oh, yeah. improve and, yeah did you and i both agree that not dying is important and is essentially guaranteed with vaccination yes but, that's what, right. about living, but what about living i mean health is more than the absence of illness. Health includes meeting our broad human needs. It includes connecting with loved ones. It includes, you know, if you're a single person, going on dates. Yeah. It includes having fun. Cool. It includes having fun, being it around people. Not being, yeah. being and blaming people yeah. for living their lives. As you and I know, both know as, as practicing physicians, I don't change hearts and minds by lecturing, by standing on a pulpit. I meet people where they are. Sometimes yes. I don't get it right. Yes. But like today I was talking to a patient who's, 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 who's morbidly obese. There's no place 
and it's not effective for me to say, hey, you know, you're overweight, what's going on? You know, like shaming and blaming. No, we need to understand the biological, physiological, behavioral, psychological components to this issue, which is really a symptom of other things. Similarly, to address someone's behavior and to help them affect change, to get a vaccine, to agree to wear a mask, to um, you know, understand the nuances of, of what it means to be healthy, is to empower them with facts, to empower them on, yes. a, on an equal basis. Doctor, patient, we are not, we are, we have a lot of training, but the patient is ultimately in the driver's seat of their health. So in my mind, and I believe you agree, the goal of medicine is to empower patients with facts, nuanced guidance for them to make decisions for themselves. I'm the guide. I'm like, as I said to someone recently, I'm like the cheesecake factory. I've got like the menu of options of the way things can go. Like, I know how it's going to go if you choose this entree. <laughs> I know it's gonna. Go. I mean, I kind of know because I've done this for twenty years. Um, and you choose, and then yeah. I can help you. I'm gonna support you, but yeah. to tell people, but give you facts and not scare you and not make you miserable about a point oh 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 nine nine five percent chance that you could get COVID. Right. So, so, you, so it is. Yeah. Shame on you for you know seeing a loved one. Shame on you yeah. for doing this or. To, to scare people about- We shouldn't have done that before, by the way, right. but that's yep. that's a whole other topic. Now we're in the vaccination era, but we shouldn't have done that shame-based, fear-based messaging before. It led to so much depression and anxiety, yep. and now we're in the vaccination era, and now we can give people incredible optimism. Yeah, and let's talk about transmission. So people are worried, okay, you know, about getting COVID themselves after vaccination. You and I agree, it's very unlikely, it's hard to get COVID after you've been vaccinated. What about transmission? I mean, transmission is greatly reduced. People are, are afraid because it's not zero. Well, guess what? That's not on the menu. Zero yeah. transmission isn't, it's not an option. Yeah. Um, it's greatly it reduced. It could be zero though. And the reason- Could it? <laughs> okay, the reason I say that is, you know that our tests, of course, are very, very sensitive. So PCR-based testing is very sensitive and unfortunately gives you kind of a qualitative yes, no. And we all know that, um, and we've, we've, I've talked about this in various points in the pandemic that it would be nice to know the viral load, like we know the viral load of yeah, HIV yeah. virus in your body, but that just, we just sort of went for a test that was super sensitive and then kind of get a yes, no. And so uh, the way I think of the, the, the studies that show us that transmission is greatly reduced is I think of the one that's the biggest. And the biggest is the Israeli Ministry of Health data that was um, put in a press release form on March 11th. And it was poignant because it was the year to a day you know, of the declaration of the pandemic. And on March 11th, the data showed in a very large Israel-based um, general population that there's a 94% reduction in asymptomatic infection, as well as 97% in symptomatic. And that they were doing a lot of testing at the time. And so if it's 94% in asymptomatic, the question is, that was the largest, the biggest study. And it totally makes sense because now we know the biology and we know that it, you know, the vaccine produces antibodies that go in your nose and block it off. IGA. So if it's blocking it off at the nose, like your IgA immunoglobulin and your IgG immunoglobulin, and it's sealing it off right there, those 6% of people could they even transmit or was the vaccines doing what they were supposed to do? Get in there, block it off, and then you can't even transmit and then you didn't get sick. So it may have been showing the, the virus, you know, the vaccines were working, I don't know. But I will say that there's three studies now that show your viral load after vaccination is massively reduced fourfold, including one in a clinical infectious disease article that they kept on swabbing people in long-term care facilities after vaccination, which they're still doing to this day in many places. And again, very low viral loads in the nose. And unfortunately that keeps people quarantined. It keeps people well, out of commission. Right? And this is a group that's been very lonely. So I want that to stop. Not for transmission purposes, but, but from a practical standpoint, I mean, you hear about these schools that are swabbing kids post-vaccination and then quarantining this whole school. It's just the saddest thing. It ruins the school. We wrote a Washington Post editorial yesterday that said don't test did. in schools. Yeah. yeah. Don't test in schools because you're, you're, you're closing this down, you're closing this down, you're closing this down. And also luckily in most places, and we're even turning the corner in the, north, um, in the Northeast and the upper Midwest, 
Um, luckily, and I'm about to tweet about that tonight, like we're really turning the corner and I have the numbers from the CDC. But even if, but there's so many places in the country where the prevalence is low and so these tests are gonna be false positive. Yeah, so it's important I think for people who are listening to understand that when you test someone post-vaccination with a PCR test, yeah, you run the risk of getting a positive test because they have little remnants of virus that are not in meaningful enough amounts to infect anybody else. So and in fact, they, it's showing you that they're, you're sealing off that virus. You're doing exactly what the vaccine is supposed to do, killing right, it in your right, nose. Right. You're like proving the vaccine is working and then you're yeah. making people stay home for 10 days or 14 days. So exactly. the point is you and I agree, I believe. Yes. What we should be doing is using antigen tests in vaccinated people who are symptomatic and that's all. Surveillance yes. with PCR tests, there's no role for it. Now, look, there are arguments on all sides, right? And you and I are, you know, I think humble enough to know that there are good arguments on many, many sides, but it's really hard, in my opinion, to make the argument that you should do PCR for surveillance um, when the stakes are so high, putting kids back in quarantine for two weeks for no reason, putting um, older people, yeah. making, you know, nursing home residents not see their loved ones. Exactly. The stakes are so high. I call high. that collateral damage. Yeah. Yeah. So, so the only reason to get a test after you've been vaccinated, IMHO, in my humble opinion, is it's not symptomatic. Even, it's like if you have symptoms. If you're symptomatic, yeah. and it should be an yeah. antigen test. And then we've got yeah. a rapid antigen test that you can do, I suppose, sequentially for surveillance. And but I don't. I mean, I, I totally know. agree. Symptomatic with an antigen test, if needed. And in fact, luckily, the CDC has decided to evaluate breakthrough infections in hospitalized patients only and not do kind of mass surveillance for breakthrough like they were doing last week, which is great right. because right. it is, that's what you need to know. Are we having an outbreak in this setting? Are we having this, this, you know, I can imagine a time in winter, come this winter, where we're going to swap people for RSV, for influenza, for, oh. um, you know, for COVID, for a whole bunch of things, and then we put them down the path. Oh, you have influenza, here's your Tamiflu. Oh, you have COVID and you're more sick. I mean, it can be remdesivir. But I don't think, and steroids, but I don't think we're gonna see that much COVID by the winter. I don't either. I mean, I was someone was interviewing me, uh, Melinda from the, for the New York Times today, who interviewed you recently about camps. Yeah. She was trying to ask me some really good questions about summer camps and planning ahead and what is it gonna look like? And I'm like, Melinda, I mean, she knows this because she's smart, but I'm like, the landscape, come June, which is when we're talking about, is going to be so dramatically different. Yes. I hope you publish this article tomorrow. Yeah. <laughs> because these are going to be moot. It is. It's going to it be is. Moot. It is. And I'm still asked, as of today, I still got asked about a fourth surge in the country. And I said, no, really, I promise. And, I, and the reason I promise is if we didn't have the vaccines, of course, um, that would be a possibility that people get tired of these very difficult mitigation procedures, but we have the vaccines right. and we get to just look and see other countries that are going faster. And today, four deaths from COVID in the entire country of the UK. This is a country of 66 million people, yep. four deaths across the entire so context, country of context. this disease. We have, to, we, have to do, we have to do this. We have been head down. Yeah. Survival mode, protect, 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 fear, fear, fear. Yeah. It's time to put the heads up, make nuance great again, which is the t-shirt that actually a patient yeah. has on Twitter. <laughs> make common sense great again without sounding common obnoxious. Sense. Without, yeah, it's, without yeah. Sounding obnoxious, but like, I'm not trying to say that like, oh, what's your problem? You don't have common sense. I'm saying you can trust your common sense that if someone's coughing and sneezing and has a fever, you might want to back away from them. Well, we and, test and, and, and someone should test them. And someone should test them. Yeah. And someone should test them. But they, by the way, probably don't have COVID if they've been vaccinated. That would be really, really unlikely. They probably have, you know, pollen allergies. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Also, You're right. Let's also acknowledge that, you know, COVID is still happening. Unvaccinated people are still vulnerable. They can still die. They can still get very sick. People who are at, you know, higher risk are the same people who've been at a higher risk the whole time. We know, we know though, that kids, We've done this for a while, but the kids are at much lower risk for getting severely ill. They're much lower risk for getting sick at all. So that, and then they're also at lower risk as the people in their midst are vaccinated. So when kids are surrounded by vaccinated parents, vaccinated grandparents, vaccinated teachers, because those vaccinated people can't transmit or are severely low risk of, <laughs> significantly low risk of transmitting, the kids are thereby safer. So 
you know, it's an interesting argument and a hotly debated one about whether or not we need kids to be vaccinated to achieve herd immunity. Um, I mean, I know, you know, my kids are teenagers. My youngest is 15. She cannot wait till Pfizer's FDA. Yeah, 12 to 15. Yeah. That will be May probably. And, um, you know, if I had toddlers, I would get them vaccinated. But, you know, it's going to be a different landscape by the time that comes around. And I do think we're, we, you know, as you said, if Israel is, they're the seniors and we're the sophomores, like. Yeah, just, is, we right? just have we're to look at them. Yeah, we just had to look at them, and then we actually had to look at the UK too. Her juniors, even though they're getting into their they're getting into their senior year, <laughs> and 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 they are like you said, um, you know, fourteen point five percent of our population is eleven years old and younger in the United States, and I definitely don't think herd immunity is going to require eighty six point five percent. Um, vaccination. I think it's going to require less. And I think our cases are going to be so low by then that, yes, you're right. If it's safe and immunogenic, parents can decide whether to vaccinate their young children. But unlike measles, mumps, rubella, diphtheria, and rubesis, which are all actually mandated by the CDC in most schools for um, you to, to have your child vaccinated for these particular illnesses, that's because those particular illnesses cause severe disease in children. Yeah. And um, if COVID doesn't cause severe disease in children, which is just true, I mean, it's just epidemiologically true, then parents are gonna decide for themselves. Yeah, I mean, the concern is of course, can a child who is asymptomatically infected or symptomatically infected for that matter, infect a vulnerable person in the, in the, in the world who is, you know, either vaccinated and doesn't mount a robust immune response to the vaccine because they're immunocompromised, or that person has decided not to get vaccinated and then they're susceptible. So that is true. Um, and there are other examples where we vaccinate children to protect adults, and that may end up being what happened. But the point is, at this moment in time, the yeah. adults are getting access to their vaccination. As of yesterday, everyone over 16 could get their vaccine. Right. So, okay, so when do you predict, pull out the crystal ball, that we will not be masking. I mean, clearly in my mind, and I think in your mind too, being masked outdoors does not make biological- No, we should change that now. <laughs> yeah, we should, I wish we would change that now. Because I think- The grounds being closed is like just the most biggest the tra this, this, a tragedy, but we should change that now. I mean, I don't, I don't see any argument of anybody that I respect who's arguing for masking outdoors, do you? No, you know, I think there's two reasons to change it now, actually. I have two good reasons. One is, like you said, the, the risk of outside transmission is so low. Good contact tracing studies in Ireland and China out of about like 1,000 or 1,400 people, one case that they can document outside transmission. So it's really low. That's the first reason. The second reason is actually, I think, to engender public trust in public health, because it's, this is a behavior that you have to enact, um, unlike, you know, um, something that's just in the environment, like keeping people distanced in a restaurant, you actually have to enact it. And it's not like this is the most popular thing that we've done in this century is ask people to mask for an infectious disease. And so um, it engenders public health trust, in my opinion, to give to do this uh, now with all this data that shows outside transmission is so rare, unless you're, and then also this is what the WHO has said, the entire time they've never asked for masking outdoors unless you're in crowded rallies. Right, and certainly if you're in a crowded rally and a lot of, and if yeah. you're unvaccinated, if you're, in a, if you're in a slum in Mumbai, as you were talking about, and you're out, yes. like that's a different situation than if you're out in nature in a lower risk area, um, like the United States right now, fortunately, is in most states. So I think, um, yeah, I think I think that uh, I think that I think that when do you think masks will be? Well, I do have. Okay, I have a um, I have a whole idea about this. <laughs> so Please. I think I think outdoors can be done now, like we talked about, and then um, I think that indoors. And I have, and and it doesn't mean that people won't choose to mask, um, but I have a I have a recommendation for public health officials that indoor masks should be that should be lifted once everyone over sixteen. Um, who wants a vaccine has a chance to get a vaccine and gets through their second dose. And that would take until about July, maybe July 4th, 
for example, um, uh, for all of us to be able to get that chance who wants the vaccine because it just started on April 19th, say three months to get us all vaccinated, two and a half months. And um, the reason that I say that as kind of a clean metric is I think the world is, I think that actually the United States is asking for clean metrics. When do you reduce restrictions? Tell me when, Tell, give me a metric. And I think that's not an unfair thing to say. That's a fair thing to say. And the reason that I say that is for two reasons. One, if you choose not to get vaccinated, that is your, um, that is your prerogative. Um, but those who have been vaccinated are protected almost 100% and they protect others because they can't transmit. And second, what you just said is that the, the Israel study really showed us, it was, a, it was a publication that for every 20 point increase in adult vaccination rates, it halves the rates, the transmission in children, because it's just understood, understood that as you vaccinate the large segment of the population, children can't get it because the cases are so low. And so I think that is, for me, a good metric. Doesn't mean that some people won't say, hey, I'm not comfortable. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep masking for a while, maybe even through the winter. Maybe some people, and they've already said this, I'm going to mask for a couple of years. And that's what they did in other countries after a pandemic. But I, I think for a public health dictum, you have to have a metric to lift it. And that's my metric. I like it. The, the, and I know you need to go. Um, the last thing I'll say is that, and, and I'm sorry for everybody, we didn't get to answer your questions. We're gonna, you know, I'm gonna come on a Facebook Live real soon and answer a whole a bunch more of your questions. Um, I think, you know, whatever we can do, whatever you can do, and you're doing like yeoman's work, trying to shift the narrative to take a hard right turn from fear-based thinking to thinking that is rooted in the data and the clear evidence that these vaccines are the path to our future. There's they are like opening the door to yes. Wonderland. I mean, they yeah, really are normalcy. Yeah. Before we started, like I'm debating putting this on Twitter because I know I'll get destroyed in some ways. Is that what I'm saying to my patients is after you've been vaccinated, your personal pandemic is over. I think it's, it's a fair over. point. I think what you just I mean, said is fair. Nothing in life is risk-free, but it's it's pretty over. And I think that's very summarized, it may be different. There are caveats on all that. I have malpractice insurance lawyers for a reason. <laughs> But let's face it, like we have to message optimism when it's rooted in science. It's our public ob obligation. It's my obligation to my patients. It, it is. False hope is good for no one. But, let's but this is real hope.